right. And the result was I did nothing but make money for them. Now, wherever they try to direct, give direction to, uh, for some reason or other, I don't know why, they just didn't what make it. What sort of reasons would you in think? Their, in their whole retail operation. They fail in their whole retail operation. They fail in their whole manufacturing operation. Okay, let's talk about manufacturing for a minute. Because, okay. Um, do you think in, that perhaps, well, let's talk about planning. The giant conglomerates are apparently enormously interested in planning quite far in advance, uh, five-year plans. Now, how far in advance do you think you can work in a ready-to-wear business? I, uh, I don't think there are many factors that uh, deter you from, from being able to make plans five years in advance in the coat and suit industry, that's for sure. Because of fashion trends, if you are making a line of new fashion of the batwing sleeve, and if it doesn't go over, you, you've killed yourself for the season because you, you've put your efforts in that main theme of putting, projecting a, a, a batwing sleeve or a 34-inch a length jacket or a 25-inch jacket or a long coat or whatever. Whatever fashion prevails. So how could you project what's going to be three years from now, four years from now? Yes, if you were doing staples, yes, I can understand. You're doing a pullover sweater, you know, and it's a classic. That's another matter. Or a plain tailored blouse or something, a tailored coat, or when we just made Chesterfield coats, and that the same fashion were to prevail for five years straight, you could project, but you can't project this way with the fashion industry. It's the most dangerous thing in the world, I think. We well, make up a line, sure. we, 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 the buyers come in and they look and you know, they tell you soon enough how successful you are. Be surprised, one buyer tells the other in the market. There's no secrets in our market. They'll tell you, go up to Brayton, they're, they're hot this year. Go up to Brayfair, they're hot. But when you're not, they tell each other. That brings us away. to a very interesting uh, subject, which is your relationship with retailers over the years. Uh, do you think that, uh, how do you feel about uh, management of stores today? Um, are, you as, are you close to buyers and merchandisers today? I mean, what's the general well, the, the problem with the Papa Source today is that they, they don't let their buyers stay that long. They, there's such a turnover. In the junior market today, there's a tremendous turnover of buyers. If you last two seasons, it's a lot. Is that different from the market? I don't know why. In the, old, in the olden days, a buyer was a buyer for 10, 15 years or whatever. But the, the, today, they change so fast, there's a quick turnover. Mm -hmm. In the Missy market, it hasn't been that uh, that prevalent, but in the junior market, it is. But uh, but they're changing buyers. Uh, I guess if they don't make the figures, uh, they change the buyers. I, I don't know. You know, it's, uh, the pressure from the controller to the merchandise man to the buyer is a such strong pressure today. You know, they don't let them. Uh, they cut their budget in half, and they don't let them buy, and they don't let them reorder. It, it, not many people can stay in that pressure. And how can they make their figures if they if they can't operate more freely? Did you used to get a lot of input from buyers in, in into your own business? I mean, did they were they able to tell you ahead of time? There are certain buyers that that you know can tell you or uh, have. Uh, the ability to help you, they can. They have a beautiful fashion concept, and uh, you speak with them, or you go to lunch and you talk and discuss it, uh, or they come back from Europe, from the Pret a Port, and uh, you, you you get some input. And uh, sometimes it's just a, a shoulder treatment or a, or a 
some kind of small treatment that can change the whole effect of the garment that can make it successful. And the buyer can give you the tip sometimes. You know, they shop all the couture lines too. So uh, it's very helpful. And you find that that still exists today. Well, we try to, it, it does exist, but we try to do it ourselves. Uh, our our uh, designers, I say, go to Europe. How many three, designers have you got? We have two designers. They go three, four times a year to Europe. Uh, they go to the Far East, as I said, and they cover uh, shows in New York when they come to New York, and they cover fabric shows and, and things like that. And uh, they go to the stores, and uh, we, 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 we're constantly shopping and looking and trying to learn for us to be on the ball, you know. Um, that's a, an interesting point. How many years has it been, do you think, uh, that, you're by, that you've had designers who have indeed be, uh, become that involved in seeing what the rest of the world is doing? Because it wasn't always that way. Well, we did it uh, as far as back as, uh, oh, at least 15 years ago. We sent them uh, to the credit board. We sent them uh, all over because uh, we knew. And then, of course, you know, there are, uh, what do they call them, those? Uh, uh, fashion services? Fashion services that send their brochures. Buy, you, you buy the brochures, and we, we, we get uh, French magazines, and we get uh, Italian magazines, and they're constantly looking at the mm -hmm. fashions. You have to be steeped into it to really be able to recognize something that you want to take and put on your own garment. Right. And uh, you'd be surprised how they can do it. And uh, it's very helpful. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the structure of and we the shop. We shop I'm mills. We, we shop mills. The very inception, we shop all, all the mills, you know. The fabric ideas. Oh, sure, fabrics. Colors. The okay. buyer, the, the designer goes and shops all the mills in the beginning of the season, way, way, six months prior, when they're out with the lions. And she puts down what she likes. And then uh, we would all go, my brother, myself, and my son, we would all go to the mills and see what she liked. And then we'd go to the other mills. And then we'd compare notes with the designers. And we decide to buy what we all, what the majority likes. So actually, um, then we take a cut. Yeah, we try it right. out in a garment to see if it, it's workable and how it looks. But management is very participatory in your kind absolutely, of business. Absolutely, absolutely. You're really all decisions involved. are made. Decisions are made by the majority of the partners, mm -hmm. so that we think alike. You know. That's one big difference between your kind of an entrepreneurial business and a business which is, you know, a huge, multi... Well, they have to leave it to the manager. Right, right. They can't be... Um, we treat it like our child. Yeah, yeah. You are <laughs> just much more closely and personally sure, involved in nurturing. From the inception to the finished yeah. garment to the shipping. Right. Um, we go to the warehouse at least twice a week in New Jersey to see what how they're carrying on and how they're doing, you know, to see that everything is in order. Now, I was going to ask you about that. Now, your setup at the present time is that you have your your design room. Design rooms are in the in, show. In 512. In, in 512. And you ship from where? From New Jersey. From New Our Jersey. Warehouse. We and your fabrics. There, we moved there last year. Yeah. And your fabrics. Oh, oh, did you? In, in other words, you got we to the point. We were on 37th Street. Uh-huh. But right. we had so many robberies. Right. Uh -huh that we thought it's about time we got out of New York. It was just unbearable. So we moved to New Jersey now. And we were all on one floor. We used to be in three different floors to ship. We didn't have enough room. Now we have about 40,000 feet. When your fabrics come in on the clothes that you make fabrics, in America, where do they well, go? Well, the fabrics go to the shrinkage house first to shrink, yeah, uh -huh. you know. And then they're, they're called in by the production man to be sent to the factories to be produced. We have them in Jersey, we have them in Brooklyn, we have them in New York, different factories. You don't own them, No, you we have contract. And then they send the finished garment to New Jersey. 
and then we ship from there. And so the quality control is checked out in New Jersey when Absolutely. the merchandise arrives there. When every lot comes in, we take a garment, and one garment is picked at random, mm -hmm. and a sample size is sent to the showroom, and our model tries it on, and we look at it to see if there are any flaws, to see if it fits, things like that. Now also, another reason for our basic success in, in the fit is that we have we have a grading department that grades every single pattern from size 5 to 13, mm -hmm. and also from size 4 to 16. Every pattern is graded, six different sizes. Right. But so now that's that, not different from the practice of the rest of the industry, is no, it? No, that's, that's no. typical in other we, words. We are very particular about yeah. that, and we have a very good grading department, and that helps the fit of the garment. Sure. Oh, that's sure. important. Uh, how much of your production is being done offshore? Uh, Approximately. No. I would say, um, I'm trying to think, about 40%. I would say 60 domestic, 40 import. And that's Hong Kong and Taiwan Hong Kong, and Taiwan, Korea. Korea. And I think you started things saying before about all your wools are made here. All our wools are made here, made, domestic. Yes. Yeah, your raincoats, I suppose, are all made abroad. Raincoats are import. Yeah, oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, jackets, import. I mean, mm -hmm. the rain, rugged outerwear, you know, corduroy, leather, you know, all the gimmick sweaters. You can't, you can't beat those prices, you know that. Yes, I do. Um, Let's talk about financing a little bit. You had mentioned earlier that when you and your three partners bought the business, uh, bought Raytan. Well, Chase Manhattan has been very good to us. I'll put it that way. They have backed us as we grew with more and more credit. I'm sorry, excuse me. I just want to make, you said it cost you each 27.5 for a oh, total yeah, capitalization just, uh, of 110. 110, right? yeah. Okay. And then since then, you've worked with Chase Manhattan. We've always worked with Chase Manhattan. Oh, you've we never had, had anybody else. Yeah, right. So you don't work very with exception. factors particularly. We have no ever. factors. I, okay. You we work, have no factors. You work directly with Chase, which gives you a line of credit. And line of credit, and we pay them off after the right. season. And for three months, we don't owe them a cent until we start right. producing again. Because cash flow has to be very difficult cash in this flow, kind of business, yes. isn't it? Well, you ship a lot of goods. Yeah, right. The following month, you get the money in. Yeah, right. And uh, they work with us. They've been very good to us. Uh, and oh, they follow up. They come up and look at the lines. The bankers. Really. The bankers in the in the old days never did that. The new young the young bankers now young girls, officers of bank, vice presidents, unbelievable. Young girls and young fellows in, the, in their thirties who come up and look at the lines when we have showings to see if we're really making good lines. And they're smart, too. And they understand. They and know. They understand, yeah. And they can, uh, I guess they can tell whether you're going to have a good season or not. I don't know. But uh, they're very... Well, it is interesting. They're very bright. Banking has certainly changed. It's changed. It's changed. You used to have the old-time banker. The days when I worked in the bank where character, uh, the personal relationship that I had, that was the important thing. But today, it's not done that way. Today, it's your figures, more basically your figures, and uh, the kind of business you have, and how prompt you pay in the trade, and the kind of reputation you have. They, they, they really look at every aspect. They're very bright. What about your uh, advertising and sales promotion. Have your policy? Well, actually, the policy is uh, we don't do institutionally advertising. We find that the best is direct geographic area is the best for advertising. In other words, if you're going to go to San Francisco, you advertise with I Magnon or Joseph Magnon or Macy's, or you do it directly with them, and you get better results in that particular area. If you put it in the National magazine. Mm -hmm. It's it, it, we, we're not a yes, we're not a couture line. We're not a if you're a couture line, and you do institutionally advertising, and you repeat the name Calvin Klein 50 million times, 
or Halston, it's different. But in our particular instance, we are far better off doing direct mailing. And of course, the, every department store now with catalogs. You know what? The catalog business is one of the biggest. I've never seen it like that in my life. And, and you, you are in a lot of those. We're in plenty of them, sure. And that gets results. That gets results. Catalogs get the results. Uh, uh, geographic advertising gets the results. Mm -hmm. Now I'm just trying to think. Well, we're running ad in women's wear, us, and we're opening up a line or something like that. Yeah, sure. But uh, to do institutional advertising like we used to do years ago in uh, Seventeen Magazine, and, uh, uh, Mademoiselle, uh, that was the big thing if you were in back to school, you know, when, when back sure. to school was a big thing. Today there's no such thing as back to school, uh, it's the career woman that's the big thing, big volume. But the message I get all through this is that you really have to be on top of the trends and know what's happening in terms you of your customers. You have to be on top of the trends. We have a close relationship with the entire country. Mm -hmm. We're always on a telephone. We believe in the telephone. We're always talking to the buyers. We're always finding out what's good and what isn't good. Mm -hmm. Not everything is good, you know. Sure, sure. And uh, we, we really try to learn what being sold, whether it's in sportswear, whether it's in dresses, whether it's in any trend at all, we like to know what's selling. That's the important thing, what's selling. The one why, thing I haven't asked why about, it's selling. and why, and why, is reorders. I have heard, I've, oh, I ask the question about reorders all the time, and I've gotten uh, interesting answers, and I'd be curious to know what, uh, how you feel about reorders and what's happening. Well, happened. when you have a domestic program, it's easy to get reorders. If you can get the piece goods from the mills and that they're reordering uh, uh, turquoise or, or, or purple or something like that, and you can get the colors from the mills, then you cut it. It's just a question of delivery day. We have to make it up for them. Yeah. I, I, I think yes. my question is more, are you still but do are reorders it's hard. part? It's oh, hard. Yeah. Do it's stores hard. reorder these Stores days? do re yes. They do. They, they, yes, they reorder. They can get the money from the controller. Because yeah, many right store, right. many firms have, have told me that they have, that the pattern has changed. The it pattern has changed in this regard. The way I see it is uh, they used to reorder in much greater uh, depth, but they're reordering more cautiously. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because your last reorder could sometimes be your worst mark because it's too late or whatever it is. So that's why they are very cautious. But you see, what's important about reorder is, when the old days, when I traveled in the department store, mm -hmm. five years had six stores. Today they have 22 stores. Right. There's a difference. So your volume increases just like over, you know, sure. overnight. Every department store, Every department store has so many more department, has so many stores, so many branches, that it's, when they give you one reorder, it's equivalent to three reorders you used to have in the old days. Because if they're gonna cover their stores, if they're gonna run an ad, and they're gonna be in all the stores, so it's gotta be a big reorder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you yeah. see, multiple stores have increased your volume and more business and they become giants. And have increased the initial orders. Yes, and they've become giants because they have to write orders for the key 10 stores out of the 20, let's say. They want to, let's say they want to cut down, so they buy for 10 instead of the 20. But as soon as they get one or two numbers of reorders, they buy for the 20. So they reorder for the whole 20. If you were being approached That's by, why, yeah. you know, let me say, make this statement. Please. The, all the new branches that the department stores have opened up have hurt the specialty stores. Oh. I think so. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Because they've gone into areas and plazas where only the specialty store used to be there. And now you have, you take a city like Stanford, Connecticut. We have Lord & Taylor now, Bloomingdale's. Macy's just opened up. Right. We have Saks Fifth Avenue coming. You realize four giants in a little city like uh, Stanford. 
100,000 right. population? Now, now, in a business like yours, what would you say in recent years has been the breakdown between specialty stores, business, and department stores? Department stores are way ahead. Way ahead? Way ahead, yeah. And First of all, let me explain why. We do not have a sales force that goes out on the road traveling. A traveling salesman goes to specialty stores because they're very loyal. And they'll buy from every time he's on the road. So that's a big change in your operation from Ambassador, isn't it? All our accounts, yes. All our accounts come into our showroom. We have no traveling salesmen. Hmm. Because we can't make the sample lines. It is impossible to keep up with sample lines. We go crazy. When the buying officers want a duplicate for their, to run an ad or something, we have to break our neck to, to make a duplicate to send it to them. Now, if we had 10 salesmen on the road, I could double my business overnight. We could double our business overnight if we put on 10 men in the United States. I would have to make 10 lines. You know what that costs? You know what uh, uh, traveling expenses cost? And we'd have to pay a minimum of 8% commission. Did you belong to any of the marts, or do you participate in any of the marts? I, I used to be. I used to be president of the New England mart, of the, of the trade show. I mean, the firm itself the firm is itself. involved in Dallas and Atlanta and Chicago. We're not in Dallas, we're not in Atlanta, we're not in Chicago, we're not in California. And you're not in New England? We're not in New England. Now, were you before or at some time? At some past? time, we used to be, yes. And why'd you stop? In the old days. We don't have any salesmen, we can't make samples. I see. We can't. Okay. And not only that, the Dallas show was up so early. We're not ready. The California show was up. Now, if we only have one line, are we going to send our line to Dallas, and when the buyers come in on Monday and Tuesday in the showroom, we don't have the line like some manufacturers do. They don't have the line there. Well, it's no. at the Dallas show. Are you typical of other coat manufacturers, or are you, is this special? Well, most coat, most coat people do not have road salesmen because it is difficult for a coat salesman to really make it alone just on coats on the road. It's very difficult. What about sharing a road forest? Do any of some of the must do that? Me, we I thought about it. And then when it comes to making a duplicate line, we're late. So if we can't service the man, what good is it? What good is it? And every account comes into our showroom. Just think of it. Every account, every major account comes into our showroom. Have you had any uh, people in the last several years who have decided they will not come to the New York market? That has not happened. New York is still the focal point. I don't care what the Mart say, what Dallas says, or California or Chicago, New York is the focal point. And I don't think it'll ever be replaced. <coughs> Next one? Mm -hmm, sure. Oh. Um, I have just, um, there is one more thing I would like to talk about. Uh, yeah. Um, at least one more thing. And that is, what would you say to, if a student came to you who was getting out of school, what would you say to such a young person who wants to go into this business? Where do you think the opportunities are? Think about that for a minute, because it's important, you know, I mean, the young people of today are coming out of school in great numbers. Well, are you talking in what, in what sphere, in selling? I'm talking about are there opportunities in selling? I mean, I'm talking about the garment industry, okay? There's opportunities in selling. Of course, selling is important. When you bring in orders to a manufacturer, you're the king. When you're doing well, and uh, you're the top man, you know, you're looked upon as a star because you're bringing in business. What uh, other areas well, in manufacturing? What, for instance, what about fabrics? I, it seems to me I know an awful lot of young people who are interested in fabrics, and yet certainly the fabric companies are, are not hiring right. in the same way. No. Uh, are you talking about mills? Uh, I'm saying are there mills, opportunities uh, are among manufacturing? you talking about in manufacturing I'm and talking buying about these your area. But, uh, well, in order to, to buy, I mean, he'd have to be broken in. Uh, he'd have to really do are it. People so he'd have to serve an apprenticeship uh, with the production department. That's a special, uh, that you must be knowledgeable or you can't take, although, although our, my nephew Bobby took to it so fast, it's unbelievable. He's absolutely fabulous in 
colors. He's great at colors. He's, he's great at uh, in the production end of it. He, he's great in, in, in figuring the cost of the garment. He's uh, good in every aspect of the of the production. Did he end. have any training? Now, did he go to a school? It's funny. A I never took to that. My brother took to that, and I never did. He just picked it up, just like my brother did, and I never cared for it. I was only interested in the selling public relations. Right. That's all. I, the only thing I like. Made a good combination. Yeah. The two of you. And 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 he worked with the designer. My brother worked with the designer, and he worked in the production end of it. And he worked with the factories, and he also did selling. He was good at all those things. But I never. I I liked it. You know what I mean? I liked it, and and I had to make decisions, so I would concentrate on it and work with him. But the actual work was done by him, or Bobby. And my son Arthur's the same way as I am, although now he's getting more into production too. Did either of the boys go to a technical school? No, like they MIT? did not. They, no, 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 they did not. They just picked it up from being with us. Right. Yeah. Well, that's because they. Uh, Practical experience. Yeah, and they, they were uh, part of management's family yeah. anyway. But and, for uh, young people who are not born into the family, so to speak, yeah. Um, well, you can start as a salesman. We have some young boys now starting as salesmen, and they're, they're learning, and mm -hmm. they're selling, and everything else. And, and the, the more, well, we watch them, and if they become very strong, uh, we give them more responsibilities, you know, and yeah. then we value their opinion, and then one thing leads to another. Um, if a young person comes out of school and wants to go into business, what would your advice be? Wants to go into business? And my advice would be to learn the business first. Which means to go to work for somebody else, probably, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. It's a very treacherous business. How much money do you think it takes these days to open up a business, however small? Well, I don't know what uh, field. I mean, whether it's sportswear, sometimes sportswear takes less, uh, sometimes... Uh, Give me a range. I, I really don't know. Uh, I would say... Uh, <laughs> I got to take that. The overhead is so tremendous yeah. now in our business. You know, it's a big, it's a huge overhead. So, but I, I'm talking, we could, no, I will say this. You couldn't do what I did 28 right. years ago. Yeah. To start with a, a small amount of dollars, you know, where $100,000 mean, meant something. Right. Right. Whereas today, it doesn't mean anything. When in those days you paid for a yacht of goods two seventy five or three and a quarter, and uh, and now you're paying uh, twelve seventy five or sixteen dollars a yard, you know, there's, there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. See, right. so it's uh, you know everything is relative. Sure. Listen, we used to hire people for fifty dollars a week, and now you have to hire them for four hundred and five hundred a week. Same people. How long does a hundred thousand last? Yeah. So that at this point, you really you've got to have a you really have to have a, a financial man to back you. You know, have the confidence in you and back you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what Calvin Klein did was the most phenomenal success in the world. Yes, it's unbelievable. Yes, yeah, so he started off. in nineteen sixty-eight. All right, so he started. Well, he borrowed ten thousand dollars from Barry Schwartz or whatever he did. I don't know how much he started with. Not much more than that. Am I right? And look what they did. Look what they permitted. You realize what they made last year? It's public uh, figure. It's unbelievable. Well, look at Liz Claiborne, too. Yeah, look at Liz Claiborne. I mean, it's classic merchandise. Yeah, it was. Sure is. Yeah. So uh, there's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's catch as catch can. You know, you could, you could hit the jackpot and become a millionaire overnight, or you could go broke overnight. Shoot the crap. <laughs> right. Well, that's one of the interesting things about this business, that it is well, I was a very high risk business in which there are still entrepreneurs. I tell you, I personally was very fortunate. I was always uh, uh, organization minded. And when I became a salesman, I wanted to do a job for salesmen. And I became very active. Eventually, I became the national president of the NARCUS, the National Association of Women and Children's Apparel Salesmen. I was the president. Of, I, I was able to do all that because I had a brother who pitched in for me and took over my work. And 
when we went in business, I became active in the ADL and the B'nai B'rith and, the, and then in my industry, I was always the chairman or co-chairman of UJA or Bonds for Israel or whatever. And I was able to leave and go to meetings and go to conventions and seminars and did all that and stayed away from my business and had my brother pitch in and then the boys pitch in and covered me up. And then when I come back, I do my share, whatever I had to do. And that was it. I, I would take a trip. So I would take a trip on the, with sweaters and book two million dollars in two and a half weeks. And I'd work 10 key cities in the United States. I worked morning, noon, and night. I never stopped. Come back and get them the, so they would order more sweaters, you know, be able to tell which sweaters are good. I did that for three consecutive years. See? So uh, I love to sell them. I love to meet people. I love to talk to people. And that's my forte. So I was very fortunate that I was able to combine my work with my organization work because I had a brother who was willing to share. He, wasn't, he didn't care about organization work. He just interested in the business. So he worked. There was nothing, in other words, there was nothing lost in the business because I stepped out to do something extra. But what I did extra was for the industry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I'm on the board of FIT for the last 20 years, and I worked educating FIT to the coat and suit industry, I felt it was important for the future of our industry. And the same thing goes with uh, all the drives that we have and uh, whatever I had to do. So. I really enjoyed it. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my work, and I enjoyed uh, doing these things. Very I good. I was a lucky man. Very good. Thank you very much. It's I a lucky think I, uh, to have you. I think I, uh, <laughs> I don't know how I did. <laughs> Fine. I am now going to be doing a brief recording with Mr. Ruby, Jr., on May 5th, 1982. Tell me, how, if you will, how you decided that you wanted to take on the license of a designer whose name is as well known as that of Adolfo. Well, we did it for a number of reasons. Uh, I think it's an ego kick for us to get into the better market. And it's a market we always wanted to get into. And the easiest way to get into it would be, of course, with a designer such as Adolfo, whose name is, right now, as strong as, as, strong as any designer in the business. And uh, it just opened up our business right away. Does it mean that you're selling departments that are different from the ones that you had been selling? Is yes, of course, we're selling designer departments and better departments. Mm -hmm. It's not a huge volume business, but it is uh, a very good for our image. It's taken us out of the rat race. Uh, it's put us into a plus business, and it's given us additional business plus additional volume, which um, we hope will become profitable. Yes. When you said it was an ego trip, how do you mean that it was an ego trip? Well, we have a very good reputation in the updated contemporary market with our Brayfair division. And to be quoted with all the designers of the world right now, Adolfo was a natural. And by having him and having his label, we are now a very important resource with every top store in the country, with all the better stores in the country. How many collections of Adolfo have you, have you shipped? Well, we've done two. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, unfortunately, we didn't get the franchise or the licensee until March 25th, and we opened the line up within three to four weeks, and it was, was this very... the line he did for you? Well, in conjunction with us, yes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we couldn't uh, shop the world for different piece goods, which we are able to do now. And I think our line thus far will be, will show great newness and great servability, and will be a very important designer label. 
so that you really thought of this as a as a an interesting and important way in which to expand your business. Have what are we, what kind of growth? Pardon? What kind of growth are you targeting for? What kind of volume are you targeting for? We just want to do about two million dollars this year. Mm -hmm. We don't need more. We'll be very very happy and comfortable with a two million dollar business in, in about. Mm -hmm. It's a type line you don't go after big volume because you can't sell everybody. What's your price range? We are one in our fall line and our walls. We are one fifty to two seventy five. Is that for two piece or three piece? No, that's for coat. Oh, that's for coat. That's right. You're not doing suits. No, we don't have suits. We I just have see. coats. I see. We are just a licensee for coats. Our rainwear last spring was basically about a hundred dollars at cost, and it sold very well. Mm -hmm. Uh, where there are stores like Saks that have separate Adolfo shops, are you, are you, are you? No, Adolfo, the couturier, mm -hmm. has his own shop in mm -hmm. Saks. Mm -hmm. We are in the same floor, but mm -hmm. not in the Adolfo couturier line. Right. We are Adolfo too. Right, right. And uh, we are in the better areas, but not in the designer couturier. We mm -hmm. are in designer, but not couturier. Have you any thoughts in your head about doing anybody else in addition to Rodolfo? No, I don't think so. As a That's matter of fact, we've turned down a number of other licenses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what um, is your um, mm. is your relationship with him in your in your licensing agreement um, that he will give you a certain amount of input? Right. Absolutely. Which includes what? Fabrics, design, mm -hmm. style. Mm -hmm. Some merchandising theories that they have. Mm -hmm. But the responsibility is all ours. We make the patterns. Mm -hmm. Does he have any we right to look at the... Absolutely. Absolutely. So he will check a duplicate. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. And how many, how many coats were in the collection last year and how many this year? Oh, the line is twice as big this year. Would you give me an idea? Was it 12 coats last well, year? Well, no. Last year we had about 18 coats, and we have well over 30 this year already. And the season, of course, has opened so that you know. Well, we are busy showing, and we've started mm -hmm. uh, booking the merchandise. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but it is interesting. All of these years, you really did not uh, need to or think of um, promoting the name of a designer. Well, we used to promote our own name. Yeah, that. But you see, that's what's interesting because it's a whole, it's a whole new approach in the well, market. Well, you see, what's happening is an explosion on designer label now, mm -hmm. and everything has a label with a designer. Right. Right. And in order to do the better, higher price goods, you need a couturier. You need a very well known man. And you, you, you really felt that you wanted to get into this price range? Well, it was a challenge. And we took it, we accepted the challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where it's at right now. Is it your feeling that this um, upgrading of price range will continue? Um, I, I mean. It's not an upgrading of price range. I don't mean up, it's, yeah, an addition. It's selling. It's selling a Mercedes or a Cadillac mm -hmm. versus a, uh, a Ford or a Buick, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, this is the top line of the designer labels. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as women are interested in designer labels, which I'm sure they are right now, you know what's going on in the world of uh, mm -hmm. design yeah, and uh, right. retail, it will be important. And certainly uh, Reagan hasn't hurt this man at all. Right. And what about your sales promotion uh, tie-ins? Are there, are, are you involved with advertising or publicity or? Uh, yes, we have to do X amount of advertising. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, a, when a prominent store comes in here and buys a line extensively, uh, we work with them. We are happy to advertise uh, an Adolfo line uh, with a Woodward and Lothrop, or a Garfinkel, or Marshall Field, or Sachs, or I Magnum. 
and uh, demon markets. These are the caliber of people we work with. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any um, talk about doing trunk shows, for example, together with other licensees of Adolfo? No. That's no. not been no. one of the plans, no. right? Are you going to do any trunk shows just of Adolfo? Uh, we have never been asked to do that. That's his bag. On his line, he does that uh -huh. most successfully. Uh, the women line up, you can't get a seat. It is unbelievable what he does. I would love it to happen to us. I would love to have him do us along with his line. Uh, I don't think he really wants to do that because his merchandise is three times higher than ours. Yes, four times right, sure it is. And he doesn't want to, uh, his customer is a little different than ours. What we've done is bring his label and his look into many, many more homes and many, many more closets. Because when, we, you know, there's a $500, $400 customer and his clothes sell for 800 to 1200 So there's a big difference. Um, was there any thought at all of, or does he have a suit licensee? Yes, he does. Oh, he does? Yes, he does. Right. In a price range which is I have no idea what it is. No. Mm -hmm. no. We are just concerned with our licensee. Mm -hmm. uh, we have rainwear and jackets and coats, anything in outerwear we can make. Right. Not furs. And as at the moment, as far as you are concerned, this is where you've started and you have no plans for any no. uh, expansion of it. So that the um, the the basic business of being in the coat business for juniors and for misses is still your basic business. It's oh, still, absolutely! But go, you go on. That's nine tenths of our life. Right. Of yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.